The Ear to Asia podcast is made available on the Jakarta Post platform under agreement between the Jakarta Post and the University of Melbourne. Hello, I'm Ali Moore. This is Ear to Asia. The LGBTQ plus rights issue in general has been framed mostly as Western exceptionalism, seen as only belonging to Western democracy. But I think Taiwan has proven the case wrong, right? That it can happen anywhere, basically. But obviously, it has to be based in a democratic system. So Taiwan, if you look at the political development of the country over the past 35 years, there's a lot of movement from social movements to government, right, from social movements to parliament. You have people who are activists in different movements and now are in places of decision making in the government. And so this has clearly helped kind of move along some of these issues. In this episode, why Taiwan leads the rest of Asia in recognising LGBTQ plus rights. Ear to Asia is the podcast from Asia Institute, the Asia Research Specialist at the University of Melbourne. In May 2019, Taiwan became the first in Asia to legalise same-sex marriage, a milestone which placed the island as the clear leader in a region not generally given to acknowledging issues facing LGBTQ plus communities or protecting people from discrimination. Success in the fight for LGBTQ plus rights in Taiwan is owed in large part to activists and the political progressiveness of Taiwanese youth. And that momentum is still being felt in efforts to tackle remaining rights disparities in areas like adoption, assisted reproduction and transnational marriage. But what is it about Taiwan that's made it the forerunner in Asia when it comes to the rights of sexual minorities? How has this predominantly Han Chinese society evolved from more traditional views of homosexuality? How have greater contentions around national identity in Taiwan coloured the movement? And what lessons can other societies in Asia learn from Taiwan's experience? Joining us to discuss LGBTQ plus issues and intersections in Taiwan are Dr. Wen Liu, Assistant Research Professor at the Institute of Ethnology, Academia Sinica, and a Taiwan-based writer and activist, and Adam Chen Dedman, educator and currently completing a PhD on Taiwan sexual identity politics at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Wen, and welcome, Adam. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. Hi, Ali. Adam, if I can come to you first, when we start with a look at LGBTQ plus rights in Asia, how does Taiwan's approach to those rights compare with those of other societies in the region and perhaps also other comparable democratic countries? Thank you for the invitation, Ali. Um, I think the most important thing to point out in terms of Taiwan's approach to LGBTQ plus rights over the past, let's say, 30, 35 years has really been its process of democratization and liberalization, right? So where Taiwan is today would never have happened unless Taiwan had made the choice, both through uh, the KMTs or the Chinese Nationalist Party, willingness to liberalize in part, but also because of you know, new movements, new social movements. There was a um, a movement called the Dang Wai movement, so movement outside the party. From 1949 until 1987, Taiwan was ruled with an iron fist by the KMT and was under martial law. And it really was sort of, if we want to use the term Taiwanese independence or, you know, activists who wanted to liberalize Taiwanese society who laid the the foundations. Um, And I think where Taiwan is today in terms of you know, passing same-sex marriage legalization in 2019, and now moving on with, um, you know, issues of trans rights and whatnot, it really is the feminist and queer activists who, who kind of came to the forefront in the 1990s that laid the foundation for what's happened today. So I think in comparison to the rest of the region, Taiwan is really seen as a leader. Um, and, you know, this cannot be decoupled from its political system, right? I think it's very clear to activists across the region from Thailand to Singapore to Japan to South Korea that Taiwan's progress on LGBT rights is intimately connected to its liberal political system. When you've lived and you've breathed this, do you agree that it is intricately connected 
to the development of the political system in Taiwan? Yes, I'll uh, agree very much so, because I think the 80s democratization movement opened a lot of opportunities for, you know, subcultures and different kinds of social movements to flourish. And on top of, you know, the 1990s and we come to 2000s, there is the push of the global LGBTQ plus movement from North America, Europe, uh, but also Asia that really connected the Taiwanese society and its liberal democracy towards LGBTQ rights advancements. So when you look at that and in that broader context, how deeply ingrained is support for sexual minorities with Taiwanese identity and Taiwanese pride at being a a vibrant and an inclusive democracy when? Do you think it is very much, just as we've said, tied up with the broader political development? Is it also tied up with Taiwanese sense of self? Yes, that's a really interesting question. I think I'll say first that unlike Western societies where there was a really deep sort of, you know, psychiatry based pathological view of homosexuals or LGBTQ plus people and the sort of institutionalized and religious based stigmas around LGBTQ plus people in Taiwan, we really did not have that kind of history. Right. So what's really interesting is that the Taiwanese LGBTQ plus movement did not go through this long periods of deep pathologicalization. It directly connected to the sort of political mobilization from the 80s to the 90s. And around, you know, 2010s and, you know, 2014, we have the Sunflower Movement was really important for our generation because really inspired new conceptualization of local Taiwanese identity against sort of the rise of the Chinese regime. This was a student protest movement, wasn't it, in around 2014, I think? Yes. Yeah, it was against a sort of Chinese-based neoliberal trade deal. It was very fiercely opposed by, you know, student-led movement and that occupied the legislative yuan uh, for months. And what happened was that the mobilization and the infrastructure that the movement has built um, were connected to the also vibrant LGBTQ plus movement at the same time. So you see this very intersectional connection between being Taiwanese, being of this young generation, and being LGBTQ plus at the same time being seen globally. Adam, in fact, in a very similar vein, you write in your research, this is a quote, for my informants, the Taiwanese nation and their Tongzhe sexual citizenship are mutually constituted. Can you explain that and also explain the term Tongzhe? Well, so the term Tongzhe is actually uh, originally a term that was used by the KMT or the Chinese Nationalist Party. It actually comes from a quote from Sun Yat-sen, sort of the, the father of the Republic of China. And it was later actually adopted by the Chinese Communist Party. So the term Tongzhe literally means of the same will. But in English, it would be defined perhaps as comrade. And so, you know, in Beijing, you will often hear Xi Jinping, the paramount ruler of the party, calling out to the Tongzhi of the Chinese nation, right? The comrades in the struggle. So this term was adopted or was perhaps uh, sort of reformulated by sexual minorities, um, really coming out of a movement in Hong Kong in the late 1980s and early 1990s. And now the term is used broadly across the Sinophone world, so the world where where Chinese languages are spoken, as kind of an umbrella term for LGBTQ plus identities. So when you talk to people in Taiwan, for example, they would often use the term Tongzhi to, to refer to themselves. And so what is, how is it mutually constituted in terms of that quote you read? You know, I want to just go back briefly to the comment you made at the beginning about Taiwan being a predominantly Han society. And I think we have to place... Taiwan's history within a framework of settler colonialism, right? Because I think for an Australian audience or a you know a U.S. audience, it's really clear the connection between European colonialism, right? Settlers coming from Europe to Australia or to you know the United States and setting up shop, erasing Aboriginal history and peoples. And a very similar phenomenon has happened in Taiwan over the past 400 years. And so I think that, you know, politically over the past, let's say, 80 years, really, it's been the position of the KMT and the CCP that Taiwan is an inviolable part of of China, right? Whether that's the PRC, the People's Republic of China, or the ROC, the Republic of China. But before the early 1940s, this idea that Taiwan has always been part of China 
was not sort of uh, doctrine by either the KMT or the CCP. And Taiwan, you know, has to be placed within this long history of colonialism going back to the 17th century with the Dutch and the Spanish, with the Qing dynasty, and we could make arguments about whether or not the Qing was even Chinese, was it Manchu, then the Japanese sort of colonial period, and then the Chinese coming back in. And so I think, you know, to be fair to Taiwanese sort of identity development over the past 35 years, rather than argue that you know, Taiwanese are asserting a national identity of being Taiwanese because they want to, you know, provoke the PRC or they want to, you know, maintain this division system. I think the the reality is that Taiwan has been colonially suppressed for over 400 years. And so it's really only been since 1987 that the political system in Taiwan has allowed local subjectivities to emerge And so that development of local identity, of connection to place, connection to Taiwan as a home country, I think, you know, is in is, as I said, it's mutually constituted with the LGBT movement, because without that sense of democratic, liberal, political space to be LGBT and Taiwanese, the two would never have emerged in the first place. And this is really a question not just about history, but it's also a question about Taiwan's future, right? What is the future of Taiwan's LGBTQ plus movement if the PRC were ever to annex the country? When can I ask you, and I know that you're too young to have any, I suppose, clear memory of what things were like in, let's say, the 80s or even indeed the 90s, but from your research, how difficult was life for the queer community in Taiwan before this movement began? Um, I was born in 1987. I, um, you know, lived through some parts of the 90s and early 2000s. And that was a really interesting time because the 1990s was actually a really vibrant sort of cultural time for LGBTQ plus production. We have all the sort of famous novels and films that came through the 1990s. And that was also uh, a part of the reason that Taiwan was seen as LGBTQ plus friendly around that time. But in terms of the social spaces were, you know, still very sort of invisibilized. It's not um, like now you will see mainstream music video that feature, you know, same-sex couples or that it is sort of almost a kind of political correctness that we recognize that people's partners can be, you know, the opposite sex or same sex or transgender. So in the 1990s, it was, and I would say, the sort of very subcultural scenes of LGBTQ plus circles. The 2000s, because of the rise of the internet, we have a lot of chat rooms, we have more sort of publication exchanges uh, via blog posts, um, so more cultural exchange in early 2000s. But also we see the mainstream community react with this um, you can say fetishism that they wanted to know more about this secret community. So there were a few incidents in which um, cable journalists they went into lesbian bars and gay bar with hidden cameras and outing lesbian and gay people on national television. So that was a really sort of you can say a scar of the LGBTQ plus community, but that also provoked more politicization of the community that. They realize that they really need to mobilize and to be visibilized in the ways that we wanted, not to be just seen from the ways that we did not want to. And when does that mean that the key players in this campaign were from the community, that it was very much queer community driven? Yes, it was a very much a a grassroots movement against, you know, media stigmatization, also the police raids in bars, that sort of things. Adam, when you look at the early challenges or even resistance, what sort of challenges and resistance did the movement face, particularly in those early days? Yeah, well, I think, you know, in the early 1990s, when social movements were really taking off in Taiwanese society, you had a very active feminist community. And I think one of the earliest kind of schisms or ruptures perhaps in the feminist movement was over lesbian identities, right? And whether or not lesbians in Taiwan would be accepted by the sort of mainstream feminist groups, right? And so this became an issue of division within the kind of solidarity, so to speak, of the community. But I think, you know, there was really, as Wen said, you know, this kind of 
politics of visibility, so to speak, in the 1990s, right? It was really subcultural. I mean, if you go back to some of the uh, the few public demonstrations around queer identities that took place in the 1990s, a lot of the people marching had masks over their face. You know, it was, it was really difficult uh, to come out. And it wasn't until 1998 that Hotline, the first sort of LGBTQ plus NGO, sort of a community-based organization, emerged. And in fact, you know, I think in 1999, when they tried to first register legally their organization, they were rejected and they had to go back the following year. Um, and so in 2000, they were able to legally set themselves up as an NGO. And I think that, you know, 2000, if we want to put a, a date on the real kind of shift in the movement's tactics, I think it was around the year 2000, because that's when, for the first time, the Democratic Progressive Party, or the DPP, that was basically an activist-based um, group in the 1980s. They uh, had contested the first um, Democratic election for the presidency in 1996. They lost. But in 2000, they won. And Chen Shui-bian, the candidate, became president. It was the first time that the KMT willingly gave up power. And in October of 2000, the uh, Chen administration set up a human rights consultation committee. And that committee was the first time that Taiwan had publicly articulated a commitment, at least in theory, to the principles of human rights. And in fact, Chen Shui-bian, his administration, while we can criticize sort of the outcomes or perhaps the lack of political will to follow through with some of the promises, he did meet with some LGBT rights activists in the early 2000s. There was even some discussion about potentially you know, having some kind of law around same-sex marriage. It never went anywhere, and it was likely because of the DPP's fear of political fallout over this issue. Um, I think Taiwanese society at that time was probably not ready, And but, you know, we could always make that argument, when is society ever ready, right? But the 2000s definitely were a watershed moment in changing the political space for the kind of what Wynne called the politicization of the movement. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I just want to add that, you know, that was a really interesting moment because um, the whole platform that Chen Shui-bian was running for his presidential election was governing by human rights. So that was his whole political campaign, right? That, you know, because the DPP had went through the martial law period, an era that severely lacked any sort of human rights, right? In terms of political refugees, in terms of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. So in 2000, I mean, they argue that, you know, if Taiwan needs to be seen internationally, it needs to be a nation with human rights. And if folks remember, right, in, around the late 1990s and early 2000, the global discourse of human rights, you know, the idea of gay rights was very, very contested, but it was sort of the new milestone that the human rights discourse is, is marching towards. We see the same thing in the United States as well, right? All the sort of legalization campaign around anti-discrimination, around a lot of the sort of bills that, you know, the grassroots groups were pursuing was all around the late 1990s and early 2000s. So I think Taiwan, you know, was really eager to access the international world through that, you know, discourse and image of the human rights. And when, if we look at that momentum, which seemed to then move relatively quickly because we got some significant further milestones, didn't we, in the education system in the early 2000s and indeed also with bans on discrimination for employment, which came, I think, 2007. Yes, I would, I would say sort of surprising speed, right? But, you know, the incident of Ye Yongzhi, which is a, a young non-conforming kid, and they were really bullying school and die, you know, tragically in the school bathroom. But that inspired the campaign of the gender equality bill in education around 2004. And pretty quickly, that uh, there were discussions around partner registration and around, you know, the earlier campaigns of the legalization of same-sex marriage, which actually included, you know, two other bills of civil partner registration, but also the diverse family bill. So it was actually a really kind of feminist pursuit of diverse family formation and partnership all started around that time. And Adam was, I guess, the real game changer, the legalization of same-sex marriage. Yeah, I mean, I think what Wen said about the um, Ye Yongzhi or Rose Boy, as they're often referred to in, in English, that that tragic incident in 2000 really galvanized the LGBTQ plus movement to realize that, you know, visibility alone was not enough, 
right, that there needed to be a push towards legal protections for sexual minorities. And so, you know, to kind of trace the genealogy of same-sex marriage mobilization in Taiwan, um, despite the um, sort of unkept promises by the Chen administration to come up with some kind of draft bill around uh, same-sex marriages in 2006. So, you know, we're looking back now, what is this, 17 years or so, so Xiao Meiqin, who is currently the Taiwanese ambassador to the United States at the time, was a legislator in Taiwan's mm-hmm. parliament. And she was the first person, uh, the first legislator to openly propose to Taiwan's parliament same-sex marriage. Now, unfortunately, her bill never went anywhere, uh, but it was an important beginning, right? And then it was just three years later in 2009 that the uh, Taiwan Alliance to Promote Civil Partnership Rights, or TAPCPR, uh, they were a group of lawyers that came together in 2009, um, even before they were formally registered, to say we need a legal strategy in Taiwan to make this happen. Three years later, in 2012, they formally registered, and they were the primary legal team and strategist behind the momentous constitutional court ruling in May of 2017 that said that, you know, prohibiting same-sex couples from marrying was unconstitutional. And so really, I think we have to give credit to the activist. There is a critique that is often made about Taiwan's LGBTQ plus movement that it's, you know, the DPP and, you know, sort of Taiwanese independence activists trying to differentiate Taiwan from China, trying to gain American sympathy and, you know, support and sort of using this rhetoric of tolerance and liberalism and progress for reasons that are politicized as opposed to, you know, being genuine. But I think that is a a reductive way of seeing the movement, but it also discredits the work of activists, right? So of course you had to have a more liberal political space or this never would have happened. But it wasn't as if the DPP was the real engine behind it. It was the activist that pushed this through. At the same time when recognition of same-sex marriage, legalization of same-sex marriage but not marriage equality. There are some very different factors in how this happened that have put gay marriage in a different category. That's right, isn't it? Yes, I would say that's a compromise between the activist groups and the current administration because while the Taiwanese society was really quick to accept, I think, LGBTQ plus communities and its legal pursuits, uh, you know, in a really compressed 30 years. But, you know, in early 2010, we also see really significant conservative backlash, particularly from the Christian right community. And the major contestation really happened around 2018, when we had four sort of referendum bills that were voting around um, same-sex marriage bills, also with the education bill on LGBTQ equality. And unfortunately, because how the referendum was running at that time, that's combined with the major elections in Taiwan, the KMT forces were able to rally the sort of gender and sexual conservative forces that push against the amendment of same-sex marriage that directly through civil code. So in order to bypass the referendum, the administration used a separate bill, that's what we call it today, right, that have similar rights to marriage equality, but we're missing a lot of pieces, right? So even for now, a lot of the activists are still pursuing for, for instance, that was just happening, right? The transnational marriage bill, the adoption rights, et cetera, et cetera. They had to be fought separately. And I do want to return to those. But Adam, can I ask you about this? Because that protest movement, the, the I suppose the anti-rights campaigns were led by Christian groups, weren't they? Yeah, and I think that's such an important point that Wen made that I just want to you know reemphasize that you know Taiwan is by no means a predominantly Christian country, but yet the sort of religious based opposition to same sex marriage was largely led by conservative Christian organizations. Mm-hmm. But these Christian groups quickly began to mobilize and form alliances with other religious communities in Taiwan, such as certain Buddhist groups or organizations kind of devoted to upholding traditional Confucian values, because they wanted to increase support for their agenda and to decouple it from purely Christian values, right? Because that that discourse didn't really have broad purchase in Taiwanese society. And so, you know, I think it's important, as Wen pointed out, that, you know, 
when the first kind of anti same sex marriage um, or anti gay march was held, it was in October of 2009, the same year that TAPCPR, the organization I mentioned, was founded, right? And they, they in fact marched and openly denounced homosexuality as a so called abomination in God's eyes. And, and I think that this is a really critical factor to the legal kind of compromise that the special law governing same-sex marriage ended up taking when it was eventually codified in 2019. Uh, But I think there's, you know, just to point out a little bit more, there's some really great sociological work being done on this um, by one Taiwanese scholar named uh, Ying Chao Gao from Virginia Commonwealth University in the U.S. And in fact, he has a book coming out by NYU Press called Liquid Conservatism, Queering Anti-LGBTQ Movements Between Taiwan and the U.S., And Gao points out what he calls transnational sex religious networks that were actually involved in kind of these global flows of anti-LGBT sort of leaders and, you know, so-called pro-family organizations and anti-gay ideas and conservative discourses. Um, And so I think, you know, we have to place that into a broader global context because there is clear evidence that anti-gay religious leaders from places like South Korea and Hong Kong and the United States were intimately involved in the movement to oppose same-sex marriage in Taiwan. And so the reason that this referendum, this sort of plebiscite on same-sex marriage was allowed to even be held was because in May of 2017, when Taiwan's constitutional court ruled that prohibiting same-sex marriage was unconstitutional, they made the slightly unusual kind of caveat that rather than immediately legalizing same-sex marriage, they were going to give Taiwan's parliament two years until May of 2019 to implement the legislative details that would govern same-sex marriage. And so I would argue that because of that two-year grace period, if you want to call it, It was kind of a compromise, I think, in a Taiwanese context to say, all right, rather than sort of engage in what some people might call judicial activism and immediately legalize same-sex marriage, we will turn this over to the parliament and we will allow them to figure it out. But if they don't figure it out by May of 2019, same-sex marriage will become automatically legal at that point. And so that two-year period really caused sort of cultural wars in Taiwan. The anti-same-sex marriage groups mobilized with, you know, lots of funding. Um, It's unclear exactly where all the funding came from. We know that some large Taiwanese corporations, including the electronics manufacturer, HTC, their CEO was a big supporter of sort of so-called traditional family values. So I think we have to place the imperfect legal form that Taiwan's same-sex marriage law took into this broader culture war that erupted. When do you see it as part of a broader cultural war? Uh, I think very much so. I mean, when it was happening, it was sort of uh, probably one of the largest cultural wars that happened in Taiwan. But in a way, it was also, for me, manufactured. Because as I said, I think in Taiwanese society, we didn't really have a very sort of vocal or visible anti-LGBTQ plus history neither in our medical history nor in our religious-based history. And when we see from the same-sex marriage campaign, you see Buddhist leaders came out and um, supporting LGBTQ couples and even held the first few lesbian weddings in Taiwan. So in a way, it's not sort of this traditional versus modern, that type of cultural world. It was mostly a very well-funded, you know, transnational campaign that was seen gay rights as a political opportunity for them to become visible through this anti-LGBTQ plus rhetoric. So I think that was a really interesting moment, right, that happened in compressed modernity. You're listening to Ear to Asia from Asia Institute at the University of Melbourne. And just a reminder to listeners about Asia Institute's online publication on Asia and its societies, politics and cultures. It's called the Melbourne Asia Review. It's free to read and it's open access at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. You'll find articles by some of our regular Ear to Asia guests and by many others. Plus, you can catch recent episodes of Ear to Asia at the Melbourne Asia Review website, which again, you can find at melbourneasiareview.edu.au. 
I'm Ali Moore and I'm joined by Taiwan LGBTQ plus scholars Adam Chen Dedman and Dr Wen Liu. We're talking about Taiwan's ongoing journey towards greater recognition and rights for its LGBTQ plus communities. So when when we look at the ongoing restrictions that are still there. And for example, when one of the key ones, I know transnational uh, marriage was uh, initially banned, there have been some changes to that, but there are still bans on marriages with same sex partners from the PRC, from the People's Republic of China. How is that justified by the government in Taiwan? Yeah, this is an interesting problem because according to our constitution, that uh, China, or we call it, you know, mainland China was still part of our territory under the Republic of China bill. So we have very kind of weird, I guess, legal setup between Taiwan and the PRC that they can't be seen as a completely separate country. So when the transnational sort of uh, marriage bill was proposing, uh, do we see the PRC citizens as similar to like the Hong Kong and Macau uh, residents or are they, you know, separate or just foreigners coming to Taiwan? So that was a debate that I think in a way beyond the LGBTQ rights is, is really whether we should amend our constitution, whether we should see PRC citizen just as regular foreign citizen. And when that part is not completely resolved, I think it's really hard for the government to push for clear boundary setting in a way, right? And so it's it becoming a very sensitive issue and particularly for people who may be supporting same-sex marriage, they may be worried about the sort of national security risk when the government doesn't have a very, you can say, robust way of vetting the new residents in Taiwan. So that become, you can say, an excuse for the more sort of conservative pro-Taiwan people to say, oh, let's not go there yet, right? Even at the same time, we have heterosexual couples between the PRC and Taiwan. They can't get legally married and their spouses can't just become legal residents in Taiwan. But with the current uh, you know, adoption of transnational marriage bill, that's not allowed. So I think we, for the audience, just to make it clear, Taiwan in 2019 ended up passing a special law to govern same-sex marriage, right? Um, as we've discussed, as a result of a compromise due to the constitutional court ruling in 2017, and then a referendum or a plebiscite uh, that voted overwhelmingly against amending the civil code. So because the civil code was not amended in Taiwan to legalize same-sex marriage, but rather a special law, a separate law was passed, that is why all of these kind of legal absurdities um, emerged. And so, you know, Taiwan was the only country that has passed same-sex marriage that had these restrictions on Taiwanese citizens marrying same-sex partners from certain countries. So the way the, the special law worked was from 2019, so from May 2019 until just January of this year when Taiwan's cabinet issued an executive order to amend this, the issue was Taiwanese same-sex partners could only marry a partner from a country that also had legal same-sex marriage. So that basically meant if their partner wasn't also Taiwanese, they only had about 30 countries they could choose from. And obviously, Taiwan is the only country in, in Asia that has same-sex marriage. So the, you know, the many Taiwanese sort of LGBT people who have Japanese or, you know, Thai or Hong Kong or Singaporean partners were not able to legally wed. And so I think we need to point out that TAPCPR, the legal team that won the constitutional court ruling in 2017, they have been fighting this from the very get-go. And so they knew that the special law that was passed was not perfect. It was better than not having any law. But they were fighting it from the very first day that same-sex marriage was legal, made legal in 2019. And so what happened, though, was between 2019 and the end of last year, TAPCPR had to fight four or five cases in Taiwanese courts that were sort of ad hoc cases in the sense they weren't binding. So every single case, they won. 
They won the right, for example, for a gay man from Macau to marry his partner from Taiwan. But none of these rulings were binding. So it became completely absurd that you had all of this legal precedent whereby there was no legal justification to prevent these transnational marriages. But you were forcing transnational couples to individually fight for the right to get married in the court system. And so finally, in January of 2023, just before the Lunar New Year holiday, Su Zheng Chang, who was the former premier who stepped down um, a few months ago, he issued an order to the, the sort of household registration offices that govern the kind of local level registration of marriages to allow for these, except, as you've already noted, for same-sex partners from the PRC. Um, and, you know, as Wen pointed out, this is a divisive issue. It's connected to the ROC constitution. But that's also, you know, not a complete excuse, right? Because as Wen also pointed out, there are no restrictions for PRC citizens to marry Taiwanese citizens if they're heterosexual. And so I think that, you know, the legal team uh, from TAPCPR and their supporters, I would call them equality absolutist. And so they are completely against, as am I am myself, completely against any kind of discrimination based on one's sort of citizenship in terms of whether or not you should be allowed to marry. And so, you know, even though this loophole that bans PRC same-sex partners being married to Taiwanese, it is still being fought in the courts. TAPCPR is still working on this. So I hope that it will change, but I think that, you know, the government should be called out for it because it's created a double standard and it's not fair. Adam, can we just touch on the role of China in the broader LGBTQ plus movement? And indeed, how does China view the situation in Taiwan, which, of course, it considers to be part of itself? Right. So the China factor, right, as it's often referred to, or as some scholars call it, the PRC effect in Taiwan, you know, is ever present. It's the elephant in the room around so many issues. And so I think, you know, to be fair to Taiwan, um, when we're thinking about the struggles, not just for defending national sovereignty, but also the struggles around um, sort of legal rights for LGBTQ plus people, we have to keep in mind that Taiwan is what political scientists call a contested state, right? So it's a state whose sovereignty is de facto, right? Taiwan has a, a functioning government, its own passport, its own standing military, its own currency. For all intents and purposes, Taiwan is an independent country. But de jure or legally, Taiwan is still under the ROC or a Chinese constitution. And so you know, this is why the DPP or the ruling party at the moment will always say we don't need to formally declare independence. That would mean to discard the ROC constitution because we are already functionally independent. And so I think that a lot of this discussion around what role China plays in Taiwanese society in Western media um, unfortunately, it gets kind of morphed into these polarizing discussions about Taiwanese independence versus this sort of idea of reunification, although Taiwan has never been ruled by the PRC. But because Taiwan is a contested state, a lot of issues about the future, about Taiwan's own democratic stability and foreign interference are exacerbated because the PRC, because the Chinese Communist Party in Beijing is adamant in its position that Taiwan will be subjugated one way or the other. While they prefer what they call peaceful means, they you know, clearly over the past 20 plus years have been ramping up their military. They've been, you know, sending a sort of Air Force sorties around Taiwan. You know, there's this constant kind of belligerent saber rattling towards Taiwan. And so I think in terms of how this trickles down into the LGBTQ plus movement, you know, I think that it's undeniable that, you know, LGBTQ plus rights and progress are only possible in Taiwan because it has a liberal democratic system, as I mentioned earlier. And that can't be emphasized enough. And, and I think so, you know, in my work, I've coined this term Tongju sovereignty. Um, and it's essentially the idea that you know, the LGBT movement really over the past decade or so, particularly in the wake of the Sunflower Movement that Wen spoke about earlier, you know, the emphasis on protecting Taiwan's national sovereignty, right, its political independence, 
has been infused with every other social issue. And so, you know, if you think about the future of LGBT rights, we know that over the past 10 years, you know, Xi Jinping, the Chinese Communist Party leader, has cracked down on civil society, you know, the kind of limited space that existed before for LGBT groups has been restricted further. You know, any kind of legal or, you know, mobilizing for rights in the PRC is looked upon suspiciously by the Chinese Communist Party. And so I think, you know, Taiwanese across the board understand this better than anyone in the world because they've been dealing with this for the past 70 plus years. But it is intimately connected to the LGBT movement because Taiwanese are proud that they are the first country in Asia. Many Taiwanese are proud that Taiwan was the first to have this kind of progress. But it's not simply, you know, this kind of ruse that the government has sort of used or hijacked to differentiate itself with the PRC. When you step back and you look at public support for the LGBTQ plus community in Taiwan, and you you referred at the beginning of this interview, you talked about how things are different now in terms of portrayal of homosexual relationships. But what is the support like today? Is there widespread support? Indeed, is there even much of a focus of attention? Are people interested in the sexuality of others or is it just accepted? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really interesting observation. And um, so we have national surveys asking people's opinions about same-sex couples. And prior to the legalization of 2019, the acceptance rate was only uh, around 30 plus percent, right? So pretty low, below the 50s. But after the, you know, same-sex marriage bill, a new recent survey found that, you know, around almost close to 70 percent of the population approving same-sex couples in Taiwan. So just how quickly the legalization kind of normalize same-sex relationship in Taiwan, I think was, you know, a tremendous progress. We don't know what they really think, but at least on survey management, they were willing to say that, you know, they accept that people may have um, same-sex couples and they can get legally married. And we also see from, you know, the change of public culture that, as I said, because a lot of celebrities um, also involved in the same-sex marriage campaign. And I think that, in a way, it really kind of boosts uh, the whole cultural milieu to see that as a normality or even as a kind of progressive image of the generation. But how how is it really, right, in people's daily life? People have problems with, you know, coming out with the families or, uh, you know, a lot of material issue. And sometimes that's kind of related to change of class structure in economy in Taiwan because the low salary in Taiwan and really high sort of housing prices. I heard from a lot of young LGBTQ plus people that it's hard for them to live with the people they love simply because they're not paying enough, right? That they're kind of forced to stay with their parents until they're 35 even, you know, uh, in today's generation. So we have a lot, I think, more kind of class-based issue that is still going on. And for a lot of the community members, now we're also paying attention to a community that's not just based in the Han Chinese groups, but also indigenous um, Tongzhi or indigenous LGBTQ plus people also wanted to be seen and to be recognized their particular struggles between their communities in LGBTQ circle, but also their communities back in their indigenous family. So all those issues, I think, uh, you know, the more international issue we're seeing now in the LGBTQ milieu. But notwithstanding those ongoing issues, when, I mean, would you argue that queer expression is free, is, well, relatively free in Taiwan? I mean, from a um, an outsider's point of view, we look at things like Taipei's Pride Parade, which, you know, has huge numbers of people who turn up. How free is expression? Yeah, I would say it's very widespread. I mean, you see from if you come to Taipei, you look at these local cafes, they usually have these little rainbow stickers with Taiwan's, you know, the island in the middle. So I think that's becoming a really a standardized icon. And uh, you can ask them, you mean, you know, whether it's your support for LGBTQ plus issues. And it might just be kind of, uh, I think, a new cultural image for the generation to symbolize their progressive values. And you see that from different hotels, from different local shops that, you know, people generally would have friendly or positive attitudes of 
LGBTQ plus people and, you know, if they're holding hands, you know, it's generally pretty accepted. I think that, you know, there's both the issue of Taiwan being a beacon of freedom of the press and freedom of expression in Asia. I mean, it's clear from all international kind of indices of censorship that Taiwan has the freest press um, in Asia. And so I think in terms of, you know, the ability to speak up to uh, express oneself publicly across a whole range of issues is possible in Taiwan. You know, you can publicly call for Taiwan to be annexed by the PRC and raise the PRC flag in Taiwan, and you will not be arrested for that. But you could never do the opposite in the PRC, right? So I think it's clear that Taiwan has a very robust freedom of expression in terms of legal protections. But also to touch on your point about Taiwan LGBT Pride Parade that was started 20 years ago, you know, this has become a real symbol of Taiwan's progress across the region. And I think that, you know, apart from the ongoing struggles and challenges that LGBTQ plus people face in Taiwan, um, Taiwan at the same time is a symbol of what's possible for a lot of queer people in Asia. Pre-COVID, there were large numbers of people coming from Japan and Thailand and Hong Kong and Singapore. And so, you know, if you talk to those people as I have, you know, they will often you know, not to idealize or romanticize Taiwan, but they're very proud and they're very sort of hopeful that, you know, Taiwan is setting a precedent that even though the political systems are different and the challenges, you know, remain across the region for LGBTQ plus rights, because Taiwan is an Asian example of what's possible, it really resonates across the region. That was going to be my question, though, Adam, because we said at the outset that Taiwan does see itself as a leader. But how relevant is the experience in Taiwan to other jurisdictions in Asia? They are very different societies. Sure. And I think that Taiwanese um, you know, LGBTQ plus activists are very cognizant of the political differences across the region and that if you're up against an authoritarian regime and you're pushing for, you know, same-sex marriage or you're clamoring for rights, it's a real difficult uphill battle. But at the same time, there's progress being made. It appears in places like Japan, South Korea. In fact, this very week, there are a group of uh, Taiwanese lawyers and LGBT activists and parliamentarians who are in Tokyo sharing Taiwan's experience with same-sex marriage to a Japanese audience. And so I think that's just one concrete example of despite political differences, Taiwan is being invited across the region by activists to share their experience. Now, I think we also have to I need to offer the caveat that, you know, Japan is a a liberal democracy, even if Japan's ruling uh, LDP is not necessarily progressive per se on this issue, Japan's political system, as does South Korea's political system, at least offers the space for activists to fight for this issue. Now, in other places across the region, like Indonesia, like Singapore, uh, it, it's, it's very difficult, right? It's very difficult um, because even before the issue of, let's say, same-sex marriage or, you know, the right to change one's legal gender for trans people, you know, many of these activists, they just want basic democratic rights. So the struggle, I think, is on very different playing fields in different countries across the region. When, how influential do you see Taiwan being? I think it's really significant because the LGBTQ plus rights issue in general has been framed mostly as a Western, you know, exceptionalism. And particularly, I can say right before the 2000, it was seen as only belonging to Western democracy. But I think Taiwan has proven the case wrong, right? That it can happen anywhere, basically. But obviously, it has to be based in a democratic system, as Adam has emphasized throughout the podcast. I would also want to say, when you compare Taiwan to other Asian societies, you also see a very vibrant feminist movement which was not treated the same in South Korea or in Japan, which were still very much, a, you know, very conservative patriarchal society. So I think that particular link between feminist movement and an LGBTQ plus movement, that changing how we imagine family and gender relationship really plays a big role. And another thing I, you know, thinking comparing to other Asian society is that Taiwan's politicians 
are not so much connected to any organized religion, right? At least our presidents, when you know it's announced their presidency, that they would not say "God bless Taiwan," right? But in societies like South Korea, even Japan, or you know the United States right now, you see a lot of the conservative backlash really still coming from this organized religion system, or similar to perhaps Indonesia, right? Or facing again, you know, conservative backlash from、uh, religious institutions. So I think that's something quite unique about Taiwan. You know, I think we have probably have the the highest density of temples compared to the whole world.、Um, I think there's a data on that. But in a way, it's very free of religious expression. So we have all kinds of diversity here. So I think that really kind of play a big role in both our political system, but in、uh, the cultural acceptance of LGBTQ plus people. I think it's really important to point out, apart from Taiwan's liberal democratic system, Taiwanese activists have been very strategic, and I think that something they've perhaps shared with other activists in the region is that there is a real need for activists, right? So for people in social movements to. At some point across their lives, their career, to move into positions of power in government, and so Taiwan. If you look at the political development of the country over the past 35 years, there's a lot of movement from social movements to government, right? From social movements to parliament, you have people who are activists in different movements, and now are in places of decision making in the government. And so this has clearly helped. Kind of move along some of these issues, and I know that's not always possible in every country. But Taiwan has been really good about moving activists from the streets into the parliament, and that is a a very strategic link that they've made to、uh, nurture a lot of this progress. And when are you confident, if you look into the future, that those outstanding issues we've mentioned some of them adoption for same sex. Couples, the issue of marrying、uh, same-sex partners from the PRC,、uh, things like trans rights. Are you confident that Taiwan is on the right path and that there is momentum for for change in those directions? Yes, I am. I'm pretty confident that you know we're going toward the right direction because the debates are already happening, right? So, I mean, the grassroots community did not step at just you know same-sex marriage. They continue to fight. For a lot of the,、um, you know, double standards that you know Adam also mentioned about, and you know, not just looking at the you know vibrant activist community. I mean, as I said, we also have a very sort of vibrant cultures around LGBTQ plus issues, and I'm teaching a class on queer theory in National Taiwan University, and you also see young people bring up new issues right beyond my imagination. They're not satisfied with the current right to marry. They want to talk about non-binary identity. They want to talk about trans rights. They want to talk about even asexuality. Right. So the young people are very sensitive on what's happening around the world around LGBTQ plus issues, and they want to continue to challenge the regime and to, yeah, to push towards a more progressive future. So I'm pretty confident that we're on the right track. Adam, do you share that confidence? Yeah, I think in general, you know, the trajectory is headed in the right direction. But I think, you know, just to take the example of rights for transgender individuals, you know, there was a historic court ruling in September of 2021 that allowed one trans woman、um, named Xiao Yi to legally change her name to female. But again, like many of the transnational same-sex marriage cases, this unfortunately was an ad hoc case, and so it was not binding in the sense of applying to other trans people. And then more recently, in February of this year, so 2023, Taiwan's constitutional court unfortunately decided not to move forward with a constitutional interpretation for another case regarding the regulations that require proof of surgery to change one's legal gender. And you know, this requirement is not based on any kind of act or legal code, but it's actually just an executive order from the Ministry of Interior. That requires Taiwanese trans people who were assigned male at birth, for example, to surgically remove their penis and testes, and people assigned female at birth to remove their breasts, uterus, and ovaries, in order to change their legal gender. And so, unfortunately, the constitutional court said we were not going to make an interpretation of this, and they pushed it back to Taipei's High Administrative Court. It was kind of a paradoxical decision because. 
while some of the justices uh, did not say that they were against the right of trans people to change their legal gender, they said that they did not have the legal jurisdiction. And so it was kind of this, now it's in legal limbo. It's kind of uh, passing the buck, I guess you could say. But I think, you know, eventually this issue, because groups like TAPCPR and others are legally fighting these issues out in the courts, the general direction is headed in the right way. Well, Wen and Adam, thank you very much for your insights and for your time and for talking to Ear to Asia. And thank you, Ali. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Our guests have been Dr. Wen Liu, writer, activist and assistant research professor at the Institute of Ethnology, Academia Sinica in Taipei, and Adam Chendedman, educator and doctoral student at the University of Melbourne. Ear to Asia is brought to you by Asia Institute of the University of Melbourne, Australia. You can find more information about this and all our other episodes at the Asia Institute website. Be sure to keep up with every episode of Ear to Asia by following us on the Apple Podcast app, Stitcher, Spotify or Google Podcasts. And if you like the show, please rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Every positive review helps new listeners find the show. And please help us by spreading the word on social media. This episode was recorded on the 6th of April. Producers were Eric Van Bemmel and Calvin Parham of Profactual.com. Ear to Asia is licensed under Creative Commons, copyright 2023, the University of Melbourne. I'm Ali Moore. Thanks for your company.